Some will argue that the most important tool for precision cuts is a good measuring tool. Others will counter that the mark you leave after making your measurements is what determines precision. In my own experience, mastering both skills are what is necessary before it's time to make a cut. Years ago in the construction world, I worked with a guy that would only use Sharpie markers and a poorly made tape measure, and he could never figure out why his boards were either too long or too short. In this video, I'm gonna show you a few tips that I've found that have helped me tremendously for both measuring and marking, as well as some methods for making shapes and angles. Like my last full-size tip video, I've indexed each of the tips so that you can easily move on if you've already seen the tip. I've also got links you'll find in the description that go along with the video. Let's go. I think it's time to get rid of these once and for all. Dull points make fat lines and fat lines are nothing but trouble in woodworking. Sure, if you're building a deck and you're fighting rough lumber, these guys make sense. But thick lines can mean the difference between a tight fit and a loose joint slipping. I gave up my beefier pencils and replaced them with inexpensive mechanical pencils. It's hard to beat a 10 pack for less than a couple bucks. But if you want to get really cutting edge lines and perfect joints, grab yourself a blade and score. I bought one of these Kiridashi knives and it gets me right next to the wood. If you're worried about seeing what you've scored, grab a mechanical pencil, angle it so that you're getting the edge of the point and lightly scribe over the top of your recent cut. You'll get the thinnest lines you could ask for. Maybe you've been here before. You're looking for a scrap piece of wood for a project and juggling a tape measure or even a ruler looking for that perfect thickness. If it's not my scrap bucket, it's a pile of lumber I got from a mill where thicknesses vary. Instead of using a tape measure, make a thickness gauge. This alligator gauge slides onto the end of a board and gives you a quick measurement. I have a free pattern you can download to make your own on my website. I also have a video showing how to quickly measure and cut one out. One of the biggest annoyances I've faced in creating frames is spacing even cross members. This tip is for residents in the USA, Myanmar, and Liberia. Having used the imperial system my entire life, I'm ashamed to admit the most obvious answer to this problem is using the metric system. No splitting distances into complicated fractions and then trying to add those fractions to find even exact points for joints. I have a box I'm building for overhead track lighting that's 43 and 3 fourths inches in length. I'll convert it to 111.2 centimeters. To divide it, I'll take the number of cross members and I'll subtract one. I have six pieces here, so I'll divide my number by five. If I divide my length by five, I have 22.2 centimeters for my center joints. Once I've made my first mark, I'll add 22.2 to my first number. After I've made my mark, I'll hit the plus button again and add my next mark. We'll do this all the way down until we reach the end. Because I'm making half joints, I'll use my lap joint jig and mark out the thickness. No, I'm not fully conceding to France, but I have to admit this is the easiest way to create frames. And a lot of tape measures already have the metric system on the opposite side of the tape. The most important tool that every shop should have is an accurate measuring method. But while tape measures are inaccurate for woodworking, my more preferred method, the yardstick, has its own errors and problems. If I lay it on the table, you can see that it has warped, making it difficult to measure things. Besides that annoyance, the second issue I've had is hovering over the top of the stick to lay my mark. Lastly, and I know I'm not alone with this, it's frustrating when the stick moves as I'm holding it down. To strengthen my ruler and get me right next to what I'm measuring, I made a square measuring stick out of square tube and attached really grippy tracker runner on the base with epoxy. Then I set the cured combination on a flat surface before adding my yardstick. Finally, I plugged one end of the tube on the zero side and added this flap attached into the plug with a hanger bolt with a thumb screw on the end. This will work like a tape measures hook to catch the end of my work. Years ago, I did a bite size on paint transference. It goes like this. Add paint to the back of something and press it against something else to leave a mark. This works great if you need to leave a blind mark to hang things, like a pattern. Does it work? It's hit or miss, but I found a better method. I found a roll of sticky foam from Amazon, which I'll cut a square from and use a hole punch in the center. I'll place it over a hole pattern I want to drill out. Alternatively, you can use mounting foam tape. Once you've attached it to whatever you want to transfer a mark from, you'll use a marker on the opposite side. Confused? Let me give you an example. I have this thermometer I want to hang on the wall. It has two keyholes for screws, but who wants to measure out the distance between both holes? Instead, I'll take a couple of these squares, punch a hole through the center, and attach them directly over the screw holes. Now, I'll use a permanent marker and mark the side away from the thermometer. I'll find where I'd like to place it on my wall and press down. I can now know where to drill for my anchors. The one drawback, of course, is that you'll be leaving a mark behind, but if you're already covering the wall, this shouldn't be much of an issue. 
Unless you're looking to duplicate an angle, bevel gauges on their own are very limited. Used in conjunction with a speed square or a square head protractor, and they are an invaluable tool. Let's say I want to find 65 degrees from the edge. With the square, we'll use the pivot on the corner. Line up the hook of the square to the edge. Draw a 90 degree line and pivot it, using the degrees markings along the edge. If I draw my line with the pivot at 25 degrees, between my 90 degree and pivot line is 25 degrees. From the edge I pivoted to the mark is 65 degrees. If I line up my bevel, I have a 65 degree angle from the edge. The square head works very similarly, but doesn't use complementary angles, and is actually a little easier. I can add the square head protractor directly against the bevel stock. Instead of measuring from the 90 degrees down like the speed square, I'll measure from the horizontal edge up to the 65 degree mark. This makes finding angles a little more straightforward and uses less math. I like using the square head protractors as I don't have to draw any lines to use it. Just set it and forget it. If you make things, you're going to need to add marks of some kind of the material you're working with. And while sandpaper has been known for years as a wood eraser, sometimes you don't want to sand to remove marks. A good pencil remover tip for wood or anything you've added graphite to is a little denatured alcohol. Add a little to a rag and wipe off the marks. It's alcohol which is good as it both evaporates quickly leaving things dry and the fibers won't plump up and become raised as it's not water. If you have indents in wood from a pencil, a hot iron and a wet rag can and will raise the valleys. If you're using markers on metal or maybe added a temporary line to a machine top that became permanent, tea tree oil on a rag will quickly remove those marks. Tea tree oil is so good at penetrating things that a single drop on a balloon will pop it. But because it's an oil and doesn't evaporate very quickly, it's a terrible thing to use with wood. Adding shapes of any kind of projects has always been an either or method for me. I either use SketchUp or I use a bunch of circles to try to construct a design I'm looking for. I'm not gonna lie, it works, but usually after wasting a lot of frustrated time in the design. A few months ago, I found this flexible curve ruler that allows you to bend it into different shapes. While the ruler part I haven't found much need for, but being able to physically mold a line on the fly has made things exponentially easier. Take this marking gauge I made a couple weeks ago. Before I went with this design, I had all sorts of circles that I had created. The problem with adding graphite through the creative process, of course, is how messy it becomes. You'll either do a lot of erasing or using denatured alcohol and waiting for it to evaporate. But with this flexible ruler, I'm not leaving any marks until I get the design I'm looking for. The only drawback to this is that it's hard to flip it to get symmetrical sides. But after I get the shape that I like, I can transfer it to the edge of a piece of paper, cut it, and use it as a template. If you're interested in this flexible ruler, I have a link in the description below. Walnut, ebony, and even bakoti are some of my favorite dark woods that help make other woods explode with contrast. But there's a common problem that comes with these colors. They're extremely difficult to see after you've marked them. Whether you use a blade or a piece of graphite to sketch out and cut marks, you're taking a chance that you'll miss them when you go to cut your stock. My longtime YouTube friend Don Bullock shared a tip he's been using when he faces the same problem. Use a white or silver pencil. This is a great tip, but I found something I like a little better. I've been using these pencils for a few years, and while they add brilliant lines that are brighter than graphite, you're constantly sharpening them, like pencils I threw away years ago for a mechanical variety. But I found that you can buy mechanical chalk pencils that are used for fabric and art. A bonus is that because they're made for fabric, they can be wiped off with your hand if you need to remark something because they use a chalk-like material. This actually makes it tempting to use with all my woods, as the marks they leave can be seen on all wood varieties. If you're interested in these mechanical pencils, I have a link in the description below. A fairing stick is a thin strip of wood that when bent, creates a curve between two points. They're often used to make arches and furniture where finding a curve would be difficult. The standard way of making these is to use a piece of hardboard with a couple holes drilled on either end. A string is strung through the holes and through a smaller strip. After a few knots, you'll have a bendable piece that you can shape and a locking strip that's loosened and tightened by pulling on the smaller strip. This is complicated though and we can simplify it with a ceiling fan pole string. After I've cut my hardboard, I'll taper the ends with a sander of some kind. With a bandsaw, I'll replace the holes from the last stick with slits. Test the taper of the ends to see if the pull string fits, and really, that's it. Because hardboard can be weak, there's another stronger stick shape you can use. I'll start with a piece of hardboard that's two inches wide and mark up either end a half of an inch, connecting the center and cutting it on the bandsaw. This will give you tighter curves, as well as a strong fairing stick. However you choose to make yours, be sure to store yours flat or they will warp in time. If you're framing a wall in a home, you start from zero, move in either 16 or 24 inches, and add a stud. You can continue this process until that sequence is impossible to follow. For example, a five foot wall can take two studs spaced at 24 inches apart, and then you finish the frame on the end. This creates odd spacing that isn't symmetrical. 
Of course, to finish the wall, we add drywall, which hides a skeletal frame of the wall. If you're building fine furniture, a symmetrical system of additions is what can sometimes make or break your project aesthetically. It took me years to figure this trick out, even though I know it's a relatively known trick. If you need to space objects between two points evenly, take the number of objects that will be added and add one. I wanted to add three machine screws between a four and a quarter inch handle. Like bite size number 110, I converted my inches to metric and divided by four, which is of course one more than three. That gives me 27 millimeters, allowing me to evenly space my screws. I wish I would have known this many years ago when I experimented with spacing until I found even distances. If you need to space three objects along a plane evenly, we add one and divide the length by four, as we talked about in Bite Size 187. But how do we space marks evenly around a circle? I have a project that calls for making a pentagon out of a 12 inch circle disc, but how do I find five different points on that circle? One way is to take 360 degrees, which is the degrees in a circle, and divide it by five equal parts we need. 72 degrees would be our answer. After drawing a radius, I can use a protractor to add lines every 72 degrees. Of course, this works, but if you don't have a protractor, here's another way. I'll take a piece of painter's tape and wrap it around the sphere that I made. After removing it, I'll measure the length of it in millimeters and divide by five. I'll space my number equally, place my tape back on my circle and add my marks. The beauty of this system is that I can easily take any equilateral shape and precisely divide it into sections. And I'm not marking the face of my project, which means I don't need to clean it up later on. Thank you so much for watching. I'm thrilled you could join me. If I've shared an idea that you could use, please let me know what it was in the comments below. I'd like to thank my patrons that help me continue measuring and making marks and invite you to become a patron. You can find a link to my Patreon below in the description. Thank you. Michelle B, Keith Current, William L. McNally, Jerry Adams, Zach Finch, Rich Lightfoot, Tudor the Barbarian, Mike Laurinaitis, Les N, and Gary G. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, and ring that bell. And I thank you so much for being a part of my shop. Please leave a comment below. Come find me on Instagram at Make Things with Rob. And remember to keep making things. I do.